Buonasera. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Benvenuti. Welcome to the Embassy of Italy for tonight's uh, special program celebrating the collaboration between the National Geographic Society and the Museo Egizio di Torino on the exhibition Queens of Egypt. It is my pleasure and honor to invite to the podium for his welcome address the Ambassador of Italy to the United States of America, His Excellency Armando Barricchio. Thank you, thank you very much. Good evening, welcome to the Embassy. It's such a pleasure for me to, to extend such a special greetings to Mr. Tracy uh, Wapsencroft, the new CEO and President of the National Geographic Society, to Catherine Keane, the Director of the iconic National Geographic Museum, which we are so pleased to partner in this great endeavor. And to our good friend, Professor Christian Greco, Director of the acclaimed Museo Egizio of Torino, or the young pharaoh of Turin, as his name now, as he was dubbed upon his appointment back in 2014. A warm and special welcome, of course, to my good friend and colleague, the Ambassador of Egypt to the United States, Yasser Reda, and his lovely wife. We're very glad to have you here with us today and to welcome Director Greco back to the embassy. The magnificent new exhibit, Queens of Egypt, which runs until September, is particularly timely, opening just before March the 8th, the International Women's Day. Italy has long marked this important anniversary, and we are glad to be able to do so here today in such a significant manner. Queens of Egypt, one of the largest in museum's history. Congratulations highlights the many roles occupied by women over 3,000 years ago, both of powerful women, rulers such as the legendary queens Nefertiti and Cleopatra, as well as ordinary women, mothers and sisters and daughters. But I will let the experts dwell into that further on. What I'm pleased to focus on tonight are Italy's many connections to these interesting time themes. Director Greco will offer us the opportunity to learn more about the extraordinary contribution of Italian archaeologists to the discovery of burial sites from the Valley of Queens to the discoveries in Dar el Medina metropolis, necropolis, and on the close ties Italy has long had and still has with the country that we love and admire, Egypt. If you are yet to visit the Museo Egizio, I encourage you to do so. Founded back in 1824, it is the oldest museum throughout the world dedicated to the civilization that developed on the banks of the Nile. And it boasts the second largest collection of Egyptian antiquities in the world and the most important outside of Egypt. Among its many treasures, are the over 500 objects discovered in the tomb of the architect Ka, still untouched when discovered by Italian archaeologists over 100 years ago. And it is truly incredible how well these objects are, have been preserved. To this day, we can admire in awe the Khan's clothes, food offerings, and at his wife Mary's belonging, including an amazing wig made of real hair. And we are delighted that the Queens of Egypt exhibit includes hundreds of magnificent pieces on loan from the Museo Egizio. Furthermore, Dr. Greco has truly put the Museo Egizio, one of the most visited in my country, a country that, as you know, is endowed with so many museums throughout the country, on the map as a renowned center for international research which welcomes scholars from across the world to strengthen relations with many international partners. Dr. Greco, I really believe that you are well on track to reach your goal of transforming the museum in a major Egyptological research center by 2024, when your institution will celebrate its 200th anniversary, so that whoever has a professional or personal interest in Egypt may find in Torino a center where answers can be found. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are, all of us, we are caretakers of the material culture of the past and we must preserve for future generations as it belongs to all mankind, to us and to future generations. This is why the protection of cultural heritage has always been a priority for Italy and a hallmark of our foreign policy. And those who are particularly pleased to support this exhibit and the institutions involved, which do so much in this respect. There's nothing like preserving our heritage and preserving our history that has to guide us in taking decisions these days, particularly when we are confronted with an open world where connections seems to be easy, but always it is important to remind us that we are not inventing every single time connections. We are transforming the world, building what our ancestors have been doing. And this has always been the case, particularly in our part of the world. In the great area that is blessed to the shore of the Mediterranean, and sea that is named the Middle Sea, our sea, which has always been the cradle of our civilization. Last time you were in Washington, Dr. Greco, someone commented that the Museo Egizio may well be, and I quote, one, the best hidden treasure of the world. And I look forward to hearing where our conversation will lead us this time. But tonight's discussion surely is the ideal way to prepare us for the extraordinary exhibit to skillful peace together with the National Geographic Museum which is a museum run by an institution that we admire because I think that the National Geographic Society is one of the great uh, reasons why this city has such not just a national but an international reputation. My friends, today is about women who rule, exemplary figures of the past who continue to lead by example today. So, gentlemen and ladies, I give you women who rule. Director Kim, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador Verikio. And to your talented staff that organized this evening, thank you so much on behalf of National Geographic. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, and um, I am Catherine Kane. I'm the director of the National Geographic Museum. Uh, it is a wonderful first event for our celebration of the opening of the Queens of Egypt exhibition, which, uh, as the ambassador mentioned, will be open through the summer to September 2nd. So I hope you'll all have a chance to see it and pick up a brochure on your way out. Uh, the exhibition is an overview of ancient Egypt through the eyes of its royal women. And it is also a survey of recent discoveries funded by National Geographic and a fascinating look at some of the explorers who are using new technologies to continue to unravel the mysteries of Egypt. This exhibition is a partnership with the Ponte Calier Museum in Montreal. Elizabeth Acote is here representing that fine institution and with the acclaimed Museum Egizio in Turin, the largest collection of Egyptian antiquity outside of Egypt. The exhibition is on view through the summer and we really expect it to be a blockbuster. I wanna give you just a couple of sneak peeks uh, just to whet your appetite. Um, of the 350 artifacts in the exhibition, almost 300 of them come from Turin and the wonderful Egizio Museum. Pictured here is an installation in our exhibition from the famed tomb of Nefertari. In 1904, famous Italian archaeologist Ernesto Schiaparelli discovered this elegant painted tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Looted in antiquity, there are only a few artifacts left in the tomb. The stunning wall paintings, however, were untouched and tell the journey to the afterlife of the beloved wife of Ramses the Great. It was one of the most prolific periods of artistic achievement in ancient Egypt, the 19th dynasty. National Geographic has produced so much media uh, about Egypt, literally dozens and dozens of stories and documentaries. So we have created some wonderful films for the exhibition, including this introductory film, which gives you an overview of the experience. 
Nefertiti, another famous queen from the New Kingdom. This is a 1926 replica from the collection of the Rijksmuseum in Leiden in the Netherlands. It is undoubtedly one of the most indelible images of an Egyptian queen in all of art history. Nefertiti was the co-regent of Agnaten, the influential and somewhat controversial pharaoh of the New Kingdom. Her mysterious life and her missing tomb remain one of the most enduring mysteries in Egyptian history. There are 12 sarcophagi in this exhibition, a big focus on the afterlife, including this incredible nested installation uh, and a mummy. And then an incredible feature of this exhibition, an immersive experience, a 270 degree theater where you're able to have a 3D immersive fly through of the Nefertari tomb created with a 3D model of the, this famous uh, destination in the Valley of the Queens. It is now my honor to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. Christian Greco is a preeminent Egyptologist and has been director of the Museo Egizio since 2014. He led and directed the renovation of this incredible museum, which was completed in March of 2015. Trained mainly in the Netherlands, he has curated many exhibitions and research projects in the Netherlands and in countries all over Europe and Asia. At the direction of the Museo Egizio, Dr. Greco has developed important international collaborations with museums, universities, and research institutes all over the world. He is an accomplished lecturer and a passionate teacher of classes and workshops on archaeological heritage at the University of Turin in Pavia, the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart in Milan, and the IUSS School of Pavia. His work as an archaeologist is particularly important. Dr. Greco was a member of the Epigraphical Survey of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago and at Luxor, and since 2011, he is the co-director of the Dutch Archaeological Mission at Saqqara. Dr. Greco has published in many popular and scientific publications in several languages. We had lunch today, and he was telling me about how he reads Herodotus in Greek for fun. He's a very accomplished young scholar, a bit of a superstar. He has been a wonderful partner on this exhibition, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Christian Greco. Your Excellencies, dear Director, Dr. King, I feel after your words it's quite difficult to start any kind of speech, but I'll try to say a few words uh, about this wonderful cooperation. I'm very glad that uh, we are finally in the United States and to start with the capital and to start with uh, your wonderful museum is really a blessing for us. We have a very active program of touring exhibitions. We have been all over the world, uh, but we hadn't arrived in the United States yet, and it's uh, a wonderful beginning, and I'm very glad to be here. Just a few words about our museum. Uh, I put here some major steps of the museum. I want to focus, though, on two dates, 1824, as the ambassador said, is the moment of the foundation of the museum, and 2015 is when we reopened the museum. We are already preparing for the 200th anniversary, and when I took a head office in the museum, I really had clear in mind that we had to improve and to enhance scholarship. Uh, well, a lot of things have happened uh, in the last few years, uh, and I just want to give you some numbers. Uh, we have more than two million uh, regular visitors at our uh, website, more than 10,000 objects sh uh, showcase and exhibit in our permanent exhibition. We have 19 research projects, uh, most of them European research projects. As the ambassador said, almost about 900,000 visitors, which uh, means that we are the sixth most visited museum in Italy and the most visited archaeological museum. Something I would like to come back later about what is a context of a museum. It's very weird, if you want, in Italy, because we are the only archaeological museum with our archaeological remains not coming 
from Italy itself, and still we are the most visited. Uh, I know, well, for me it's more than logical because uh, why wouldn't you visit a uh, wonderful Egyptian collection? Uh, we have 12,000 square meters of uh, visiting uh, path, and we only last year, uh, what, two years ago, we had three awards and 270 mummies. I put it here because very often uh, people uh, put a relationship between Egyptian collections and mummies, but also because I want to show you something special later on. We have been present in uh, almost all the continents. Uh, there was a day last year uh, when I came to open the exhibition in Montreal, that in the same day I was in Egypt, in Europe, because I had to stop over, and then in, um, in Montreal. And the very day that we opened an exhibition in Montreal, we were opening also an exhibition in China. So we had activity in fourth continent. Uh, we haven't been in Australia yet, but uh, we're working on that. Uh, that's why last year the uh, publications concerning uh, the, the development and the, um, of the collections and um, have appeared in many languages, as you have seen. But let's start and focus on the theme of tonight, mainly the value of the Queen and the Medina. And I really want to start with this village, which might be unknown to some of you, uh, Dura Medina, on the West Bank of what nowadays is Luxor and what uh, used to be one of the religious capital of Egypt, Thebes. Here we are on the West Bank. You see actually uh, the line that separates the fertile zone from the desert. And here we have this village founded at the very beginning of the New Kingdom, let's say at around the middle of the 16th century BC, founded with a precise goal to house here the artists and artisans whose task was that of building the tombs in the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens. Those of you who have been in Egypt must be familiar with this wonderful site uh, with the tombs uh, of the site and with the village itself. And most of you probably have visited the later temple of Athor, which hangs to the north, the perimeter of the village. The village was investigated starting from 1903 by the Museo Egizio e Bauer, his then director Ernesto Schiaparelli. And that's why in the Museo Egizio in Turin, we have one of the largest collections of objects coming from Dura Medina. Objects of daily life, objects coming from tombs, and I will show you something later on, and a wonderful archive. We have the most important administrative archive preserved from ancient Egypt, more than 26,000 fragments of papyri attesting everyday life, which has not been published yet. Uh, if you see the records that we have about Dura Medina, 3,537 is written here in Italian, it says supplemento, which means our objects coming from an excavation. In our registering system, what is called catalog is the first part of our uh, um, collection bought in 1824, and everything which was added is what is coming from excavations. So, already Bernardino Drovetti, Consul General of France, in 1824 managed to sell to the King of Sardinia the wonderful collection of 5,600 objects, Kingdom of Sardinia, because Italy did not exist yet at that moment, and he bought for 400,000 Piemontese lira a wonderful collection. Let me tell you, 400,000 Piemontese lira means 60 million euros, which is a lot of money, but also means uh, three quarter of the budget of the Kingdom of Sardinia. Can you imagine, and you can also imagine how many times I used this argument with the Ministry of Culture, <laughs> encouraging him to enhance the uh, financing of cultural heritage. But there was a vision there, there was a vision of how this collection could make Turing the international capital of Egyptology, and also a vision of how, and we have a letter written by Prospero Balbo to the king in saying only if we buy this collection, Italy 
will be a great country because Italy yet to be because we will have the biggest collection of Roman antiquities in Rome, the biggest gallery in Florence, and the biggest museum, uh, Egyptian museum in Turin. Well, so already some objects arrived with Bernardino Drovetti in 1824. We see here this uh, wonderful uh, Pyramidion, a very important stele belonging to uh, an important person called Maya. You will meet him later on. And uh, some other uh, relief coming from tombs, but in 1894, uh, something else happened. So this is scattered around the objects which were brought in the collection by Drovetti. In 1894, uh, Ernesto Schiaparelli became director of the museum, and he realized that it was very important to go back to the field, to start excavation, to give an archaeological context to these objects. He was lucky because his professor in Paris had been Gaston Maspero, and Maspero had become, by that time, the uh, director of the Service des Antiquités, and he told him that he could go to Egypt and start an excavation whenever he wanted. So actually, he excavated all over Egypt, from Giza to Aswan, but he concentrated in Thebes, in two very important places, Dura of Medina, so the village of the artisans of the pharaohs, and the valley of the queens. And he discovered wonderful objects. He wanted those objects to have a context. So we have in our collection that very nice uh, cobra, which is called uh, Meret Seger, she who loves silence. And then we have this kind of stila where you see a king. We can read his name in the cartouche. Cesar Carré is Amenhotep the I. And behind him, you see the uh, queen Ahmes Nefertari, his mother. And very important, actually, is these two people that we see kneeling underneath, because we can read here their title, and it's written, Sejem Ash and Set Ma'at, servant in the place of truth. And this servant in the place of truth, which we now know that means that we're special artisans who were working in the royal necropolis, was not self-evident at the time, but there's been scholarly research in order to understand the importance of the Medina, and it all started with the excavations. In our collection, ready from 1824, we have this wonderful statue, it's probably a Ramesside copy of an original of the 18th dynasty, a statue of Amenhotep I. You can recognize, again, his cartouche and his name, Jezer Carré, and with this wonderful wooden statues of Ahmes Nefertari. And if you go to the uh, exhibition at the National Geographic Museum, you will be acquainted with this wonderful queen and the wonderful woodwork where she's represented with her son. And we have many of these Ushaptis or funerary statuettes who are the servants who have to help the disease after death and they are all, as you see, they have this pre this name uh, identifying their function, Sejem Ash, so servant in this place of truth. How did we come to understand the value of these objects? Well, I already mentioned it, Ernesto Schiaparelli in 1903 decided to have extensive excavation. Now, I expect you to speak fluent Italian uh, and to understand what he says here, but I can sum up here in English. He just says to be very careful when you carry out excavation, to be very careful when you collect objects, and to be careful about their context and to keep everything distinct from side to side so that the objects can speak in their context. They not only become artifacts, but they are also linked, very historical document linked from the place they are coming from. And so, for instance, in 1905, Schiaparelli discovered in Dura Medina, in the necropolis, this wonderful chapel, the Chapel of Maya. It has been re-exhibited in the Museo Gizzo. We had a long discussion during the renovation whether we wanted a showcase where we could see the structure of the uh, object itself or to 
make this dark so that we could only see the inside, but actually I wanted to make it completely visible because every object has its own biography. Biography telling us about the story and its function when it was functioning thousands of years ago in Egypt, but also all the transformation it went through in its museological life. But let me bring you inside this wonderful chapel to discover how this very important workmen of Dero Medina were not only working for the tombs of the king and the queens, but they were decorating their tombs as well. This is the village nowadays, and so we have in the western part of the village the necropolis, where we have some chapels, and this is a reconstruction of how uh, a temple tomb would look like, so you would have a pylon, an inner court, a second uh, court where you would have a chapel with a pyramid, a, py a pyramid, a pyramid on top, and the stila. You saw it already. It was already in Turin, 1824, where the painter Maya was named. But Schiaparelli wanted to go back to the field and to find where actually this was coming from. This is the picture he took in 1904. And this is the reconstruction, architectonical reconstruction we can make now to see how such a chapel would work and would function. As you might know, an Egyptian tomb have always a dichotomy where a part which is above earth and functions for the living society where people would bring offerings and then you have a shaft going down to the realm of the dead. And all the, the, the walls will be decorated with paintings and texts attesting different ceremonies, different steps of their funerals and as we will see, the ritual pilgrimage to Abydos. So actually, in looking into the decoration, we get to know much more about their theological view their, uh, and all the efforts they made to preserve life after death. So we see here we are at the very moment of the funeral. We see that the coffins are transported on a bar put on a sledge. There are uh, people uh, coming along bringing uh, animals which will be slaughtered during the funeral. Uh, there are women weeping and crying. As you see, you can see the tears in uh, their uh, cheeks going down. And there are offerings which have to be brought to the tombs and put in the um, chambers. Underneath, we see uh, pictures depicting uh, uh, Maya and his wife Tamit with in front their son Honsu doing all kinds of offerings. And on the lower register, we see that there are these barks which are starting the uh, pilgrimage to Abydos. Of course, going to Abydos was very important. In Abydos, there was the cenotaph, the empty tomb of Osiris. As you know, according to ancient Egyptian theology, uh, Osiris was the first king of Egypt. He was killed by his brother Seth. His body was recomposed by his sisters, his sister and wife Isis and his sister Azet, and then he came back to life and he became the king of the year after. Well, going towards his empty tomb was a way of connecting to his destiny and having a life after death. Of course, the disease, in order to live after death, they needed offerings, and these offerings were brought uh, by their families, but we also assist to uh, uh, a kind, of using a Latin word, what we call the reification of the word, actually imputing uh, magic uh, offerings where just the pronouncing the name of the, uh, of the words could make the offerings come alive and give the neediest supplies to the diseased. Well, 1905, the tomb chapel of Maya was discovered. Also, the tomb chapel of Kha, another very important person. Kha was Imi Erkaut Nezut, you say in Egyptians, responsible of the works of the pharaoh. Funny enough, though, even though the chapel was found, the burial chamber was not found because the tomb 
of Ha is quite peculiar. The shaft is not in the inner courtyard, but was 29 meters to the north. Schiaparelli, we don't know why, um, decided to take down the paintings of the tomb chapel of Maya and bring them back to Florence for conservation and then finally to Turin, but not the paintings of the tomb chapel of Ha. The year after, though, he went back to Egypt in order to look for the burial chamber. He wrote in his uh, notes that he was looking for his big discovery, what he called his Rachel. He wanted to find his Rachel, well, in biblical terms, that was the coronation of his efforts. And this happened on the 15th of February, 1906. I show you the very moment when he entered the tomb of Ha and he found the tomb completely filled with grave goods, 460 objects completely preserved, and is the only intact New Kingdom tomb preserved outside of Egypt. Some of you have been to Turin might remember the uh, old uh, exhibition, which I kind of liked actually, of the tomb of Ha, where actually the attempt was to reproduce how crowded the burial chamber was and how the objects were one next to the other, as you see. Now we devoted a whole wing of the museum to the tomb of Ha, which is one of the most visited gallery, it's one of the most visited part of our collection. And so we see, for instance, here the external sarcophagus of Ha, the intermediate sarcophagus, and the inner sarcophagus of Ha. And on the wall, we see the 40 meter 50 Book of the Dead papyrus, or the wonderful golden mask of his wife, Merit. And other material coming from the tomb, some of the jars still containing the residues of food and liquids inside. Some of them still con uh, contain the residue of wine, beer, sacred oils. And let me show you the very moment the tomb was discovered. So here again, Schiaparelli wanted to find the tomb of Ha. He had his Not really. Let me try again. It seems they don't want you to see it. So, well, I'll try later if I manage. Otherwise, you will have to come to Turin to see it <laughs> in person. What kind of documents do we have? Well, many that allow us to understand what we have in Odor Medina. We have the written. Uh, inventory, handwritten inventory. We have the official letters which were uh, sent to the king, we, but we have many notes. We have 39 linear meters of archive. We have photos and objects. And all of that, just putting the inventory number, allows us now to understand where the excavators were working at the time. This is some of the material we have and some of the notes. And actually, you know, it's in a very different time. So most of the time, actually, we have to go to Rome because what we have here are just the minutes of the letters that he was officially sending to the king. And of course, then the original is in Rome in the state archive. And sometimes it's very different. And it's even interesting to see how he changed his mind at the end. And to the official report to the king, a slightly different sentence was used. This is the site. Uh, nowadays, where our uh, French colleagues are working, because in 1921 the uh, excavation in Dura Medina stopped for the Italian party, and Emile Bruyere started excavating there. And I'm very pleased that uh, the current director of the IFAO, uh, Laurent Babet, asked us to uh, join forces, and we might go back to the field next year. So the Museo Egizio, after 100 year, we'll go back to Dura Medina working side by side with the French and it's more than natural that we go there because we can again connect what we have in Turing 
our archive, our photo archive, our material with what the French are doing and work together also in a, a profound sense of restitution to Egypt. Sometimes in our archives it's very interesting to find photos that can show you how the places were at that time. Let's, here we see part of the uh, um, chapels dedicated to Meret Seger, she who loves the silence, so the cobra goddess, and is a kind of station between Jural Medina and the Valley of the Queens. Uh, so let's say halfway there were these worship places. And look at some of the notes, completely unpublished, that we have made by Ballerini, so careful in attesting everything we were finding. And actually, finally, we are able to say where the Italians were working in the most important seasons. So here we have all the tombs which are described, and most of this material has not been published yet. And on some others, we don't have the description, but we have the photographs. Some of them you can see here, and they are very precious because, unfortunately, not all the tomb has been preserved, as we see here in the photos, so the photos have very important scientific value. And also it's interesting to observe here that Schiaparelli made conservation work. He was trained in Italy to be a superintendent, as we say, a supervisor of the archaeological heritage. Many people do not know, but Schiaparelli was not only the director of the Museo Egizio, he was the superintendent of Piedmont, Lombardy, and uh, Liguria. Uh, he was also uh, well, director of the museum and of the Museum of Antiquities, and he was also senator of the kingdom, so he had a quite busy schedule. Uh, but being trained as an archaeologist in Italy, he had very high in his mind the fact that not only you had to document the tombs, but you also have to preserve it. So very often in his um, photos we find all the conservation work he did, what nowadays we would call site management. So uh, we sometimes from the photo we can detect exactly the place where he was working, which has completely changed now if you go to Dura Medina and see also how many workmen he could employ. He had more than 300 workmen. Those of you who work in Egypt now know that we would never be able, could never afford to have 300 workmen at the moment. And look at this. And then when you go to the exhibition, remember these photos. Here we are in Der Rumi. We are in the beginning of the Valley of the Queens. You see he has the three tents. Oh, there is a nice little story that I have to tell you because Schiaparelli, of course, was looking for money and it was very difficult to find the money. And finally, the royal army gave him three tents. I think that at that time, the Metropolitan Museum of Art had a wonderful house in uh, Dural Bahri and the Italians had to deal with three tents. Uh, and then the year after, the royal army told him, well, we want the tents back. And he said, no, please, uh, at least leave me these tents. And then this house you see here, of course, it was not made to uh, be used as a house, but was something very necessary for the photographs, all the photographic process. And I will show you something in a little while. But those coffins that you see here come from two tombs of the Valley of the Queens. In 1904, not only he discovered the tomb of Queen Efertari, but he discovered also the tomb of Seter Chopeshev and Hamon Chopeshev. Those tombs are of princes, sons of Ramses III, and those tombs were reused as a cachette, as a secret place where two families of cultivators of lotus, many centuries later, in the 8th century BC, put their uh, families uh, to, as a final resting place. And this is the very moment where the coffins were found and lied out. And you will see in the exhibition a wonderful uh, selection of coffins and the display I saw it this morning is just absolutely fabulous. You can really see the coffins very nearby with very important decoration because they contain among others, uh, of course, uh, excerpt of the Book of the Dead, of the Amduat, and other so-called New Kingdom books of the afterlife. And you will see they have a kind of horror vacui. 
every square centimeter of the coffin is covered by text and iconography because, well, at the time there was not much the possibility to build monumental tombs, but the texts which were on the walls of the tombs, as we have seen the Chapel of Maya, were fundamental for the survival of the disease in the afterlife. That's why you had to put the text on the coffins. In other words, as Professor Van Valsen from Leiden University said, we see what we can call the architectonization of the coffins of the sarcophagi. So they come really literally the last resting place. Oh, let me try to go back and to see whether I can show you something about the enormous amount of photographs we have. So this is the house where he uh, could uh, uh, have the photograph printed. Uh, well, apparently the videos are quite difficult tonight, so I, I'm so sorry you have to come to Turin to see them. Uh, but uh, see how the situation in Dura Medina was at the time and how it is now. On the 12th of March 2019, so in a few days, we are opening an exhibition which will be called Invisible Archaeology. As His Excellency, uh, Ambassador of Italy said, it's very important to do research on the objects in order to discover the biography of the objects, to be able to dig in, in the object, to see, to find the different layers and to understand uh, the importance of them. Among which is how do you do archaeological excavation? How, what is archaeology about? Is preservation or destruction of cultural heritage? And I want to show you that we have decided in 2015 to go back in the field. We work on the northern part of the tomb of Maya. Maya was Imi Per Hech Nezut, which means the responsible of the treasure of the king, of King Tutankhamun. So you see what we do in the morning. We walk through the necropolis, just passing by the wonderful step pyramid of Djoser. In front of us, it looks like just sand, but it's not. It's one of the most important monuments in ancient Egypt. This is the pyramid of King Una, so the fifth dynasty. The first king who had his wall uh, of his pyramids completely decorated with the so-called pyramid tax. And this is the area where we are excavating. And sometimes, you know, let me go back a while. You see, uh, this is the monumental tomb of Maya. We're just to the north of it. We see we are a little bit higher. We are in the Ramesside period. And you see you have little chapels with in front of them just shoved the underburial chamber. And sometimes it's very special when one of your workmen calls you and say there are statues coming out of the sand as it happened last year and then you clean them up and you see these wonderful limestone statues coming out of the chapel in front of one there was an offering table and they were 54 centimeter high it's a nice uh, family of the Ramesside period if you look from above uh, you see the area where we are excavating. We are going back in the field very soon. Actually, in two weeks, we will be back in the field. And we have to tackle this area. As you see from this angle to this angle, there is a tomb in mud brick. This is the entrance. There are two columns. On the back, we see some limestone slabs, which are the evidence that there are chapels on the back. And... Uh, so it's a new kingdom, probably 18th of 19th dynasty tombs, which we hope still have the slabs with the name of the deceased. As I said, tombs are always a kind of dichotomy. There is something above the ground which functions normally for the living society, where the family goes and bring offerings, and then you have a shaft and you go down and you have a burial chamber. Let me show you. Uh, if we can go down and show you what we are doing uh, nowadays. Actually, this is the shaft we discovered last year. Um, I don't know why the, the video today wants to be a little bit funny, but well, believe me, you go down and then you go inside of the burial chambers. And so actually you can document 
all the activities that uh, have been carried out. So you can see where there are traces of burning, uh, what has been uh, plundered in antiquity, and what is still there to be excavated. From the tomb of Ha, I repeat, the only intact tomb housed outside of Egypt, we have many um, objects, 460, as I said, and some of them are objects which are still sealed, as you see here. There are jars and containers which have inside the remains of food and liquids which were inside. You're always facing then the question, what should I do? Should I give permission to open a sealed container which has been sealed for thousands of years? Should I take the responsibility or should I actually ask, let's try with known invasive methodologies, which I did. So, for instance, we went to Oxfordshire, where there is a neutron activation uh, um, lab, and uh, we worked um, together. It, it has been founded by the European Union, and we uh, tried to see whether we could see the surface inside. And actually, what you see, you see the shape of the jar, which seems a little bit weird. Uh, I might, you'll be asking me, well, you say there are the remains of food and liquid, but you see nothing inside, which is a very legitimate question. It was also my first reaction. But when you go to the bottom and you see this conglomerate on the bottom and you put it together, you see that it's too large to go through the neck of the jar. And actually, yes, there's been a reaction between the uh, so-called jar stopper made of clay, which fell down and reacted with the liquid inside and created this. We are trying now with non-invasive uh, methodology to see whether we can see the composition of what was inside and to understand what might have been the original liquid. And I said, well, mummies. All our mummies have been CT scanned outside the museum and among which also the mummy of Ha. You see here the former director of the Museo Egizio, Professor Curto, was the first one to introduce X-rays in the museum in the 60s. And actually happened a little bit what happened tonight with the video that didn't start. The colleagues came and uh, he, uh, the first X-rays were black, the second time they were white, and the third time the X-rays machine stopped. And then the medical doctor said, well, we know uh, Egypt brings bad luck because there are all these dead bodies in the museum, so we don't want to work there anymore. But finally, he got his x-rays. But now we have CT scan with much better quality. And what we can see is amazing. Look around the neck of Kha with this wonderful, wonderful Shebiu color, the color of Hanar, which was given by the king to high official who have distinguished himself over services for the state. And his wife, married, married means the one whom he loves, with this wonderful vase color and these very heavy earrings. And you see the spine and thorax has been uh, damaged, uh, probably in a trauma which was post-mortem. And let me see if I can show you what we're going to show to our public very soon, actually starting from the 12th of March, something that Schiaparelli never saw, because Schiaparelli decided not to unwrap the mummy of Ha and Mary. He decided to leave them uh, uh, as they were in order to preserve them. But nowadays, of course, there is no questions about unwrapping. We would never unwrap the mummy. But what we can do, we can virtually unwrap them. And so for the first time, you can see Ha in his face. Actually, you see what Schiaparelli never saw. You see these wonderful jewels. And imagine, in a museum completely poor of jewels, he never knew that there were these wonderful colors and there was this wonderful scarab. And here is the 3D model of the scarab, which we'll, we are printing out and exhibiting for the first time next week. We're not able yet to read what is written on the back, 
probably, the chapter 30A of 30B of the Book of the Dead, it would be nice to have a kind of double check to be absolutely sure that the mummy we have inside is Kha. Uh, because, as you might know, uh, very often coffins in ancient Egypt were uh, reused. Well, actually, uh, tomorrow, uh, Professor Karakuni is giving a lecture at the National Geographic Museum, and she was uh, of uh, uh, the best well-known specialist on reuse of coffins on the 21st dynasty in a period where uh, people were not able to travel to the Levant to fetch wood they would reuse coffins of previous generations. And so, well, the heart scarabai is always the title and the names of the owners, uh, of the owner, so, well, it's a kind of uh, double check. We are, now we can see there are the lines, we are not able to have a definition quite good yet in order to read the hieroglyphs, what we're getting there. And of course his wife married with this wonderful Wazak color, which we are printing out as well. So 3D models and then the printout, and actually it's amazing that leaving the, the mummies undisturbed, well, more than 100 years later, we can go back on this exceptional find and show to our public the wealth we have inside. Well, let me come towards an end telling you that there is still so much that we have to do in the Museo Egizio. There is so much wealth that we have. We have almost 20,000 fragments of papyrus like this the largest administrative New Kingdom uh, uh, archive which has been preserved from ancient Egypt. We made a distinction in what we call an object, what we call a document, and what we call a witness. For us, every fragment is an object, and every fragment will get an inventory number, which is quite nice because when we will enlarge our collection by more than 20,000 inventory numbers, which is something that a director always have to do because then you can say that you are, you are even a larger collection. But then it doesn't mean that every fragment which you will get an inventory number is also a document. A fragment will have many witnesses, many uh, text, sometimes text written by different scribes, sometimes a different text on the rector, on the verso, sometimes even in the same part, different kind of text. Of course, papyrus was very expensive and very precious, and many times it was also palimpsest. It was used and reused. So, a single fragment can contain many texts and can be part of a uh, different document. And actually now we can reconstruct them virtually. Just an example of some scattered fragments we have, and you scan them, then you put them in uh, uh, order just according to their shape, and then you realize that some pieces actually do fit together. So this piece went here, and the other vertical was here, and we recompose here, and Ramaside letter. And Actually, we have a wealth of information concerning everyday life, concerning who was working in the necropolis, who was not, what was the reason was not working, concerning quarrels they might have within the family, inheritance, etc. And this is really is going to give us a lot of information about Dural Medina. Some of the information we have uh, are published. On the journal of the Museo Gizzi, we have an online journal in Italian, French, German, and English with a summary in Arabic. It's uh, free of charge, open access, everybody can download it. It's not a PDF, but it's HTML uh, format so that everybody, and especially our colleagues also in Egypt, can read it. It's uh, free um, downloadable. And then, uh, well, we have been said that we are a large collection. Well, of course we are. But there is the mother of all museums, as we like to call them, and it's the wonderful Egyptian museum in Tahrir. Um, the Egyptian authorities have endeavored in a, a very important effort, that's the one of building, by 2020, the largest museum in the world, which is the Grand Egyptian Museum. But in the meantime, in Tahrir, we have this wonderful jewel 
uh, would I would like to call Umaldunia, really, because it's really the mother of the world, or well, the mother of Egyptology, at least. And well, I'm very pleased to say that thanks to uh, a project that we won of finance by the European delegation in Cairo, uh, the Museo Egizia will be the lead, together with the British Museum, the Louvre, the Egyptisches Museum und Papyrum Sammlung, and Rijksmuseum von Auteden, to work together side by side with our colleagues in Tahrir to make a redisplay of the entrance gallery, to write a master plan by June 2020. By master plan, I mean not only an exhibition plan, a master plan about the building, about research strategy, about the library, about touring exhibition, about programming, about retail, about everything which makes a museum a museum. And the Louvre will do the redisplay of the Tarnis royal tombs. If you are about to go to Egypt, do not forget to go to the museum in Tahrir. And even if by 2020 you will have the wonderful uh, gem, do not forget that this museum in Tahrir will house masterpieces and treasures which belong to mankind and some of the jewels of our discipline of our Egyptology. It's a house of Egyptologists and we are very, very, very glad that the major European uh, collections are now working side by side with our Egyptian colleagues. And I want to end just showing something that brings us back to Dero Medina, but also far away, as it were. I said many times that the museum belongs to the people. There is no museum without people. Of course, the museum is about material culture, but it's also about the dialogue of the material culture with the visitors. Well, first of all, with the scholars, students, visitors, and many kind of visitors, all the way down to children. And we just opened the Museo Gizio space, which we call 06, devoted to the very, very little ones. But there are children that cannot come to museum. Children who are in hospital, and we, are, we have a pediatric hospital in Turing uh, where uh, there are oncological patients that they cannot come to the museum, but they would love to come. So I uh, took office actually on the 28th of April 2014, and the day before I released an interview, and I said that I had a big dream, which was to bring the museum outside the museum. And I started little by little. You see me with some of our curators going to the hospital, giving classes to children teaching them hieroglyphs, making them drawing, etc. Well, the things we could do was bringing them a tablet with some copies of the most important objects so that they could get acquainted with the material culture. But well, even though, as you see, we were very happy to be involved with that, there was always the fact that they felt they lacked the real objects. So we're asking for real objects, but was out of question. How can you uh, organize our transport with all the security just to go there for a couple of hours and come back, it would have been impossible. And I never thought that the answer would have come from a place waiting, cheering, where also people cannot get out, and it's the jail. The director of the jail called me and said, could you come and lecture? And I went, and I gave a lecture. And then at the end of the lecture, he told me, well, you know, our students... We are taking the A-levels for the School of Art and Crafts, and they would love to be involved with Egypt. And I said, why not? So I presented the tomb of Kha, and they got very excited, and they started making copies. So good. This is, some, this is the so-called beauty case of merit, uh, which is exhibited next to the wonderful wig the ambassador was talking about, made by them, just from the drawings, they saw it, and so they made a copy of the jar, a copy of this box, and they copied by hand the 14 meter 50 book of the dead papyrus, copying the uh, course of hieroglyphs, uh, making no mistakes, and with a pretty good, pretty good handwriting. Uh, well, Jaco, what do you think? I think it's a pretty much better than my handwriting, I must say. Uh, and actually, when we went back to, uh, they wanted to show me, so I went back to the uh, jail and they showed me the objects and um, I, I mean, I, I could not believe they've done all of that. And actually I said, because they had 
copied up very nice. This is more or less uh, part of a scene of chapter 125 of the Book of the Dead. They said, well, it's so nice, I regret I don't have it for my office. And then they did it one for me, of course. Uh, so I have it also. And now we can use these objects for the children. Uh, we organized an exhibition which was called Free of Learning. So the, uh, the, the prisoner had the chance to bring their um, um, work and we exhibit it to the people. Now the children in the hospital will realize an exhibition on the object, on the Book of the Dead papyrus found in the tomb of Kha in the Medina, and they will write the label. So it's so wonderful that places that would not possibly talk with each other, they're talking. And one of the nicest things that um, a prisoner told me was, you know, now I wake up at night not thinking about that I'm miserable and I'm in jail, and, but I'm thinking about how am I going to solve that problem? How am I going to copy that hieroglyph, which is quite difficult? And he said, all in a sudden, Egypt it was keeps me alive which I think is very reasonable because Egypt also keeps me alive and it's a reason of living. So I, I'm pretty glad that we uh, uh, can share that. The material culture actually can unite people. This is the very moment when the objects arrived in the museum and the, uh, my personnel could not believe how good they were. And um, I wanted to end, uh, uh, yes. We are working very hard to say that the museum is for everybody, so we have discount for children, for elderly people, for uh, the Day of Women, for Mother's Day, for Valentine's, and then the video kind of stop, for uh, Father's Day, for students, university students. Uh, everybody can come in the museum for free uh, the day of his birthday, and then all people speaking Arabic. Uh, can come with 50% discount as a kind of uh, gratitude towards Egypt. We are indebted to Egypt of having these collections. I always say that I would like this uh, museum to be the biggest Egyptian ambassador, uh, embassy outside of Egypt, a place where all Egyptians will welcome. We have more than one million Egyptians living in Italy and many of them do not know that we have this museum and many of them do not feel this museum belong to them in the sense uh, very often, especially immigrants of first generation, they, they think that culture belongs to, well, the, the, the uh, most important uh, of the elite, let's say, and I'm doing whatever I can to reach out to them and to tell them thank you, because without Egypt, we wouldn't have this wonderful collection, which is not Egyptian, it's not Italian, but belongs to mankind. Thank you so much. So I heard we have time for two questions. <laughs> Hi, I'm James Martone. I had two very quick questions. Thank you, that was wonderful. Just about the places you work, can you, I mean, how is, can you just show up and start digging, or, I mean, how does that happen? <laughs> and then, um, and then also, I know there has been, um, oh, sorry, I know there, I mean, I lived in Egypt as a kid, and even then, Egypt was asking for the head of Nefertiti, for example, so do you ever come up, you know, are there ever claims that some of the objects should go back to Egypt? So for the first question, well, of course not. Uh, and thanks God, of course not. There is a, a permanent committee and a secretary general of antiquities and a minister of antiquities, which is now His Excellency, Dr. Khaled Lenani. So we submit mostly uh, eight to six months in advance our proposal, and the proposal is judged by the permanent committee, which decides whether you get permission or not. And then after that, we get security clearance also from the Minister of Interior. So we are registered. And the first thing we do when we go to Egypt, we go to the ministry, we sign the contract, and then the ministry also assigns us one chief inspector and two trainee inspectors, which are with us all the time, and they work with us and they supervise us. So it's uh, always a very nice cooperation with Egyptians. We go through uh, the Ministry of Antiquities, which is something 
that I also say we should all learn from because Egypt has a ministry devoted not only to culture, but also to antiquities. And we don't have it in Italy, for instance. So I find it very, um, uh, it's a very good system, very structured. And so it's on based on what you ask, what you have to do. And then you might have special requests, of course, for conservation site management, etc. Concerning uh, restitutions, we, uh, all the collection we have is uh, being bought uh, legally and attested by documentation. So as I said, 5,600 uh, uh, objects arrived with the Drovetti collection in 1824. And then uh, we have more than 30,000 objects which were acquired during excavations and it all came with the permission of the uh, um, the Egyptian authorities, and also, you know, from 1902, there was the so-called partage. So uh, there was a division between objects that would stay in Egypt and would go out. From 1970, Egypt and Italy and many countries uh, have signed uh, the UNESCO Convention, which uh, forbids to take outside of the country everything which has not been legally going outside before 1970 which means the museum is very strict in respecting this rule. Not only that we cannot make acquisitions, sometimes you see in the art market objects which would fill in a gap in your collection, but when you ask for the pedigree, you have to be sure that the object has left Egypt before 1970. And to be sure is you need to have a written document. In case you don't have it, you cannot accept it in the collection and also you cannot accept it as a gift. So if people come to the museum and want to give a donation to the museum, if they don't have the proper paperwork, they can't. And I'm very strict in that because we have to contrast illegal uh, excavation, of course, uh, and to make people realize that it's not about the possession of our objects, but it's about what the objects can tell us, the context, and so I always see that the objects is like, uh, I make the comparison, they are like pages of a book. So if you just throw out a page of a book, uh, you, you lose a passage forever. And so you need to see these pages in the context of the book. You need to see the objects in the context of archaeological context. And the only way to do that is to have control legal excavations and to publish, of course, the results. Another question? Thank you. It was a very interesting lecture. You're obviously a very creative and very resourceful uh, man. I, I don't want to give you extra work, <laughs> but um, I, I just had the privilege of renting on Netflix a DVD called Letters from Baghdad, and it's about Gertrude Bell. I'm sure you are aware of her, if you, if you are. The, the DVD that they produced, the list of um, resources that they use is very similar to what I what I'm interpreting would be your resources around the world and what I would challenge you with is to reach more people around the world about uh, the history of Egypt and the connection of people and the artifacts to those people of the world you might undertake a letters from Baghdad experience that you put into a video format and you show that on various media platforms throughout throughout the world. It really was a fascinating journey showing her and, and you might you, you might pick the old um, the old fellow who who found it founded the, uh, the, the the museum or something okay it, it's just a thought. Oh, well, I, it's a very nice thought, and uh, the ambassador uh, reminded us that uh, last time I was here, somebody said, um, oh, well, this museum is wonderful, I didn't even know it existed, and uh, this lady said, it's the best hidden treasure of the world. And actually, that phrase struck me, so now if you come to the Museo Jitsu, we have huge panels outside saying the best hidden treasure of the world, because now <laughs> I kind of joke on that. Uh, uh, but it's only partially uh, a joke. Um, it, it's always also a matter of resources that we have. Uh, we do all of this 
with very little people. We are only 41 people working in the museum. Uh, when I arrived, there were 13. Now I, can, uh, I could enlarge the team to 41. We are not subsidized uh, by the government, so we survive by uh, the ticket entrance, which is also a very painful uh, question for me because I would like to be inclusive, social inclusive, which means I, wouldn't, I would like not to have to charge a ticket, but I have to because it's the only way I can survive. Um, we, want, uh, we launched this international program of touring exhibitions in order to try to reach out to all the continents, but you're perfectly right. Uh, we are thinking in ways where we can use also the new media since we are not capable of uh, financing the traditional media, which means going on TV channels or on the radio would be too expensive for us. But with the new media, I hope we can reach out because, well, as I said, this is cultural heritage belonging to mankind and I think it's very very important that people uh, know that. I uh, keep saying um, I, I did a review on the books of children in school in Italy uh, they always have the pyramids and the, and the mask of Tutankhamun no, no one book has mention of the tomb of Kha. So I said I will not rest until all Italian knows that there is a tomb of Kha and they visited it. Well, it could be a good start, 60 million Italians, and well, if all Egyptians also would know about that. And I, I'm very happy also to be working with Egypt, coming back to that question so also, because we can make a lot of comparisons. A lot of the objects we have in the tomb of Kha have comparisons, for instance, with the tomb of Tutankhamun, and I was talking with uh, Dr. Tarek Taufik, the rector of the GEM, and we are thinking of having a double publications where we can talk about Kha and we can talk about Tutankhamun. But you pointed in a very painful spot, and you're perfectly right. We need to reach out to as many people as possible. I do my best. I, uh, and we all do our best, but um, we have to, to enhance and make more effort in order to have the word known that we have these beautiful treasures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Greco, for your inspiring lecture. I think. Uh, we are even more interested now in visiting Turin and the Museo Egizio. But in the meantime, of course, please go and visit the exhibition Queens of Egypt at National Geographic here in Washington, D.C. And also would like to thank again Director Keane and all her team for their precious collaboration on organizing this event. Grazie mille. Buona serata.